to go look for a switch by the door and put shut. Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. If we could um, find some seats. My name is Susan Chalmers, and I work for the National Telecommunications and Information Administration at the U.S. Department of Commerce. But this morning, I welcome you to this digital inclusion introductory session in my capacity as a member of the IGF Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group, or MAG. Um, so together with uh, my co-organizer, Paul Rowney, and uh, we have several uh, MAG volunteers here. Um, uh, we'd like to welcome you to this session. The purpose of this session is to set the scene for digital inclusion discussions during this week and to connect IGF participants who are engaged in digital inclusion issues. So what we're going to do over the next hour and 40 minutes or so is to break out in groups to discuss different aspects or sub-themes of digital inclusion. There will be five different breakout groups. And so please join the discussion of your choice. Pick the sub-theme that really speaks to you. And as uh, I read out breakout group titles, could I ask the group leaders to stand, please? So our first breakout group is Access, Affordability, and Infrastructure. And there you see Dulcie. Um, our second breakout group is Local Content and Multilingualism. This is Liana. She will be leading that discussion. Our third breakout group is Skills, Education, and Jobs. Here you see Rose. Thank you, Rose. Our fourth breakout group is Social Inclusion. Here you see Juliana. Thank you. And finally, um, for those who want to discuss governance aspects of digital inclusion, we have June. June will be your leader for that discussion. And um, they, have, they have volunteered as MAG members, and so thank you for doing that. So the purpose of these discussions is to decide on three policy questions or topics that you uh, would like to focus on during the week ahead. And after the discussions, we'll come back in plenary and share these questions with everybody. So it's really meant to kind of um, get in the mindset of the digital inclusion track this year. Does anybody have any questions? Nope? 
Okay. But before we launch into our group discussions, we have something wonderful in store to kick things off. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Doreen Bogdan Martin. Ms. Bogdan Martin was elected director of the ITU Telecommunication Development Bureau on the 1st of November, 2018. She took office on the 1st of January, 2019. She is a strategic leader with more than 25 years of high-level experience in international and intergovernmental relations, and she has a long history of success in policy and strategy development, analysis, and execution. Ms. Bogdan Martin has advised governments from around the world on policy and regulatory reform me measures. She has organized impact-driven global conferences with thousands of participants from over 150 countries, brokered international consensus on many critical issues, and is a regular presenter at high-level international forums and summits. As part of this important work, she was one of the principal architects of the annual Global Symposium for Regulators, directed ITU's first global youth summit and is currently driving ITU's latest high-profile initiative, Equals, the Global Partnership for Gender Equality in the Digital Age. I think we are very fortunate to have uh, Ms. Bogdan Martin open the session. Thank you so much. Please. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Susan, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a, a great pleasure to, uh, to see you all here uh, early in the morning for this introductory session on, on digital inclusion. As Susan mentioned, I'm the Director of Development at the International Telecommunications Union. Uh, so, of course, anything about Digital divide and digital inclusion is really close to my heart and it's really core of, of the mission that we have uh, in the development sector of the ITU. This morning I want to uh, set the stage a little bit before you get into your breakouts to talk a bit about uh, digital inclusion. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to invite you all to stand up for a moment, please. Okay, so look around, and if you're in the back, you might actually want to come forward and sit at the table. Thank you. Okay, so for those of you that are in front of me, I'm going to ask you to sit down. And for those of you over here to my right and in my immediate right, you can also sit down. And just to my left here, you can sit down. Okay. So again, look around. So in today's world, those of you are standing that are standing are connected to the internet. You are digitally included. And those of you that are seated are not. That's the reality. Half the world is connected and half the world is not connected. And we will never really have a fully digitally included society until you're all standing and you're all connected. So thank you for standing and now you can take a seat. Uh, you know, I think it's important to, to remember because those of us that are connected, we forget about all the people that are not connected. Um, we've been on our cell phones or our laptops many times already this morning, uh, and it is really easy to, to forget about those that are not connected, about those that don't have any opportunity to access the wealth of resources and opportunities that the Internet brings. A couple of weeks ago, the ITU launched its latest um, Facts and Figures report. Uh, you may have followed. Uh, and last year, as you know, at the end of the year, we celebrated the fact that 50% of the world was online. Uh, and then we also took note, uh, disappointingly, that 50% of the world was not. Uh, well, this year, the good news was that we went from 50% to 53%. But the bad news is that growth rates are slowing, in particular, 
in sort of the, the countries that fall at the bottom of the pyramid. So those that need it most, the poorest countries, the most vulnerable groups, growth rates are slowing. And what causes also great concern, and I just came from a, a breakfast roundtable on the digital gender gap, is that the digital gender gap is growing. And so our, our statistics show us that this year, the percentage of women connected to the internet stands at 48%, while the percentage of men connected is at 58%. And we're seeing this divide grow each year instead of shrink, which causes great concern as well. And when we look into the, that particular divide, uh, basically in every region of the world, uh, men have more access than, than women, uh, except for the Americas region. So in Africa, in Asia Pacific, in the Middle East, that digital gender gap is, is growing. And it is really um, something of great concern. Uh, well, the whole fact that there is a digital gap in general is also something of of great concern. And yesterday, for those of you that participated in the Day Zero events, how many of you were in the sessions yesterday in the main room? Can you raise your hand? So a number of you were there, and you would have heard from, of course, the minister from, uh, from Germany, uh, who mentioned several times that the internet belongs to humanity. I thought that was a, a great quote. Uh, we also heard from Fatumatu Ba, who's from Senegal, and she talked about a lot of her work. And she was saying in her, in her keynote presentation, she gave some great numbers uh, that really bring it home as to why connectivity is so important. The number of, of doctors in Africa, one per 1,000 people. Three nurses per 1,000 people. I think she gave the example, I don't know if it was Cameroon or Cote d'Ivoire, that if you were to build a school every day, you still wouldn't have enough schools for the uh, young people that need to be in schools in that country. And when we look at things like education, I think the, the latest statistics are that there's 262 million children out of school. And we know that in seven out of 10 countries in the world, there's not enough teachers. So we don't have enough teachers. We don't have enough doctors. When it comes to things about agriculture, we see that there's incredible opportunities that connectivity can bring. When we think about education, when we think about healthcare, we see that connectivity, in many cases, is the only answer. It's the only answer to really tackle some of the world's greatest development challenges, and that's why it's so important for all of us to focus on digital inclusion and figure out ways that we can close the gap. And I hope we can actually come up with some constructive ways forward in the, in the breakouts. So in terms of addressing what's keeping people offline, I think the conversation has moved a bit from just looking at the supply side. For many, many years, we've been focused on infrastructure, infrastructure. Yes, infrastructure is still uh, a challenge, but when we look at, for example, 2G connectivity, pretty much covers the planet. 3G connectivity, we're over 75%, and some, some numbers say we're, we're even getting close to 90%. So the signal is there, okay? But people are not connecting, and why are they not connecting? Again, we heard from a number of, of speakers yesterday, affordability is a huge challenge. Within the UN Broadband Commission on Sustainable Development, we set a target for affordability. Initially, we set that target at 5% of monthly GNI. We then lowered the target to 2% of monthly GNI. And so many countries have not reached that because connectivity is prohibitively uh, high, the cost. And when we look, for example, in Africa, we can see that the percentage is somewhere in terms of monthly GNI from 9 to 20%, and in one country, it's up to 40%. That's huge. So it, 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 it's no wonder that, that, that people are, are, are challenged to be able to actually uh, pay for the cost of, of, of getting online. And so that's in terms of the service. But devices are also pro prohibitively uh, high and expensive, and a lot of that has to do with taxation. And when we get to the discussion part, I would like to, to hear from some of you if you have ideas as to how we can address 
some of those challenges around, around affordability. The other thing that we, we heard um, from, from many colleagues yesterday was about digital skills. So the, the problem is that so many people don't have the skills that they need to actually be able to benefit from connectivity. Uh, and we really need to, to redouble efforts when it comes to our educational systems and structures in making sure that we do roll out the basic digital skills. Uh, and we also heard a lot about lifelong learning because once we get those skills, we need to make sure that we continue uh, to get refreshers in that space. Um, we were pleased a few months ago to announce with UNICEF that we were teaming up on a school connectivity project uh, called GIGA. And we are working with UNICEF to try to find ways that we can actually uh, do, and Mike, you'll remember this, when world leaders came together around the WISIS in 2003 and 2005, and they committed that by 2015, we would connect every school in the world. And guess what? We failed. We failed miserably. We didn't connect every school in, in the world. And what my friend from Namibia has just told me is, was it five years ago you said? Perfect example. So 10 years ago in Namibia, 30% of the schools were connected, and today, 30% of the schools are connected. So there's something wrong there, right? So we have, as I said, joined forces with, with UNICEF, uh, and we're looking at first mapping school connectivity. Let's figure out where all the schools are in the world and which ones are connected and which ones are not. Then when it comes to figuring out how can we finance the cost of connect connecting those schools, Let's be creative in our financing models. So we've been inspired by um, the Gavi Alliance. Gavi was put together, as you may recall, to address uh, the global va vaccine problem. And what they did was they pooled demand. So how can we figure out how we can pool demand around school connectivity and come up with something that's financially attractive for those that are interested in investing in school connectivity? And then the third part is about the technological solutions. There's so many technological solutions out there, so what are they? So we're doing a toolkit of last mile connectivity uh, solutions on the technical side, and then with that, what are the necessary enabling uh, framework, enabling policies that need to be put in place so that those last mile connectivity solutions can actually be sustainable and thrive? And then of course, the final part is what do you get once you're connected? And that's where the digital public goods come in. And you've probably heard in the discussions yesterday and since the UN Secretary General launched his high-level panel report on digital cooperation, this notion of digital public goods. So that means goods that are available publicly, open, that are reusable, can be adapted. And the most important thing when we talk about school connectivities is thinking local, local languages, local needs, and being able to adapt that. So it's an exciting endeavor, am ambitious indeed, but, uh, but we think that, that, that we can get there. Um, so the other thing, again, uh, coming back to yesterday's discussion, so we have the, the affordability barrier, uh, we have the skills barrier, uh, and we also have this, this barrier which is lack of relevant, meaningful content. And how can we address that? And I think it's time to sort of stop telling developing countries, uh, remote villages that we know what they need. It's, it's time to actually sit down and, and let those that need this connectivity decide what they need. We've seen lots of exciting um, innovations. Uh, that one that was presented recently at the AI for Good Summit of the ITU linked to agriculture and it was Penn State University working with FAO and they came up with this app that they're calling Nuru. Uh, and this app actually enables them to detect uh, a, what's it called, Sarah? It's a, it, it's a sort of a pest. It's a pest that attacks the um, cassava plants. And using this app, you can actually detect this um, insect that's eating away at the plants. And what's great about it is that it's, it's all available in, in local languages. And, 
and it, because it's voice activated. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, but I think it's really, that's a great example of meaningful connectivity. It's, it's addressing a problem uh, and it's not imposing the barrier that we often see around uh, local languages. Another exciting uh, innovation that we've seen, again, thinking local, is linked to e-health. We have a partnership with WHO called Be Healthy, Be Mobile, uh, and we have seen some exciting results in Zambia, where we're, we're using mobile phones, uh, and in this particular situation, we're trying to address cervical cancer, uh, which is a big thing in Zambia, and trying to uh, roll out using SMS campaigns and other means the importance of regular screenings um, and the follow-up uh, actions linked to that. Um, and, and the results are, are quite encouraging in that space as well. Um, and there, there's just so many other examples, I think, that um, it excites us about the link between bringing the skills to the local communities and then letting the local communities then uh, use those skills and try to develop applications themselves that address their concerns in villages. A couple of months ago, uh, we went to uh, Niger. Um, Niger was hosting the African Union Summit in July, and we went to Niger with a number of, of UN colleagues. And when I tell this story, I like to say, you know, normally UN colleagues, you go into a country and you bump into your colleague from WHO and your colleague from WFP and uh, your colleague from UNICEF, and everybody says, well, what are you doing here? And what are you doing here? Uh, and there's like this lack of coordination amongst us, and this um, initiative we've been running in Niger uh, is a great one where we have all come together. Uh, we didn't just bump into each other, we came, in, we came together before and we literally all got on the same bus and went to this village in Niger to launch the Smart Village Initiative. It's something that we're calling now a prototype and we hope to roll out more in Niger. We're looking at also starting in Indonesia and hoping that we can scale this and spread this to uh, rural villages around the world. And what's great about this effort is, yes, it was connectivity focused, but we didn't want to just bring connectivity for connectivity's sake. We wanted to bring connectivity with the agriculture solutions, with the education solutions, with the healthcare, healthcare solutions, so that really the community could then benefit and, and thrive. Um, so again, so many, so many exciting things out there that um, I think it's time to really uh, tackle the barriers and, and, and begin to move the, the needle. Uh, we heard when Tim Berners-Lee spoke at, at lunchtime, he stressed the notion of meaningful connectivity, and that's something that we, we featured in this year's um, Broadband Commission annual report. And what meaningful connectivity is, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily just focus on those that are not connected, we also have to remember that there's lots of people that are connected today, but they might not be meaningfully connected. So how can we also make sure that we're not just focused on those that are not connected, let's also focus on those that are connected to make sure that we can help them use connectivity to actually make changes and improve and improve their lives. And again, coming to this meaningful connectivity notion, we think about the importance of, of availability uh, of accessibility, uh, of affordability, and then of course we need to keep in mind, as I mentioned before, uh, the content, local languages, and of course the issue of, of trust uh, and security, which is uh, an area of, of, of big concern. What I want to um, maybe, maybe stop with, and then we can, we can open up um, for questions, I was at the ministerial roundtable yesterday and there was a, a quote that, that, that someone gave um, and it, it was an Einstein um, quote um, where he defined, although I, I don't mean to say that this is insanity, but he talked about insanity. Um, and it was about um, insanity being doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get different results. And when, when he said it, I thought, well, that, that, that says it all when we talk about digital inclusion and the digital divide. Because connecting the other half of the world 
is not going to happen in the same way that connecting the first half of the world did. And so we can't keep doing over and over again the same thing. It's really time. It's time to change. It's time to change the way we do business. It's time to change the way we think about our regulatory frameworks. It's time to change the way we're thinking about our universal service funds or using them or not using them. It, it's really, this is, this is the moment. We really need to think differently to bring the rest of the world into the digital space. We live in a digital world, it's everywhere, and we can't let half the world be left behind. And with that, I will turn back to, to Susan and we can, yeah, okay. So with that, I will pause um, and open up to some questions, if there are any, or comments before we move to the breakouts. Please, we have a few minutes for questions. So if you'd like to pose a question to Doreen, uh, uh, just please raise your hand and push the button on the mic. Uh, yes, please, in the back, if you could uh, come to a mic on the table. And if you or could say I guess who you are as well when you take the floor. And then there it is. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, I'm Deborah. I'm a human rights uh, education trainer. And I'm here with a delegation from the Youth Department of the Council of Europe, and I'm also here uh, as a, um, to advocate for youth participation. And we had uh, a meeting uh, called the Youth IGF, during which we draft some youth messages. And um, I will, um, one of the messages that we draft was about net neutrality. And uh, while talking about that in working groups addressing this issue, um, when talking about connectivity, there was a sentence before saying like, in order to increase the connectivity and to like um, close the gap, we should find way to have investors put money in these things. Uh, but it can be worrying uh, because we have the case in some countries in which uh, connectivity and internet services are not affordable and we have big companies stepping up. So for instance, there is a case, I don't want to be wrong, but I think it's Nepal that where Facebook was providing internet access, but only if you subscribe to Facebook. And this is really worrying because it means that we are uh, like telling companies that they can provide internet, which should be, uh, I really agree with that, like human rights. So people can have internet, accessible internet, only if they subscribe to a company, giving out their data and accepting some terms. So when you say investors, I got a little bit worried because having the, all this discussion about this and, you know, of course it breaks net neutrality. Uh, I wanted to have a little bit of a clarification about that. What do you mean when you talk about investors because sometimes uh, it's problematic. So only that. Thank you. Okay, could we take maybe one more question? The gentleman here. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is uh, Jameson Ulufuye uh, from uh, Buja, Nigeria, uh, founder of Africa, Africa City Alliance and uh, around contemporary consulting. Uh, uh, Dr. Martins, uh, I was there during your election at ITU, and I'm so happy that uh, you're doing very great. Well, the presentation was great, uh, but what I see that is very fundamental when it comes to digital inclusion is the role of policymakers. They need to, I think they need to be people-oriented. Uh, once policymakers are people-oriented, then they can easily drive uh, the frameworks that will uh, ensure inclusion. So what do you think about this with regard to uh, inclusion generally? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll take one more question and then I'll come back to you, yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Vasilis. I am um, a member of a community network in Greece. We are developing an um, infrastructure to provide internet connectivity to some remote isolated villages in central Greece. Um, so we work uh, in uh, three pillars, like deploying the infrastructure, building skills for locals, but also um, empowering and building the local community. And I believe that this aspect of connectivity is really important when we are talking about connecting the unconnected, because um, 
the local community is actually uh, the driving force that can uh, support and sustain such an infrastructure. And I think this should also come uh, into our discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you for those, for those comments. So a, a few thoughts and, and reflections. Um, I mean, first I'd like to thank the, the youth uh, representative. Um, and I didn't actually allude to, to youth when, when I was speaking. And of course, when we think about digital inclusion and we think about the context of Africa, for example, where I believe 40% um, are under the age of, of 15 and what is it, 50% in, in the next couple of years. So when, again, when we think about youth issues in general, let's remember uh, in particular the, the, the population and age numbers in Africa because that's an audience that we need to pay attention to. And when we think about connectivity and digital skills, and the future of Africa. We need to be focusing there, and we need to be focusing there now. Um, and of course, um, statistics show us that the, for 60% of all children in primary, at primary age, that they will end up in jobs that actually don't even exist today. And so again, this whole notion of digital, uh, we need to make sure that we're equipping them now with the skills for their, their future. Um, so coming back to the point about investors, um, I think we need to keep in mind that, that all stakeholders have a role. Um, yes, policymakers have a key role in this space. Uh, the private sector has a key role to play, mobile operators, social media companies, uh, civil society, uh, development agencies, and the development banks. Uh, I think everyone has a role to play in closing the digital divide. Um, so please do keep in mind that, that multi-stakeholder um, participation and, and need in, in closing the divide. Uh, and again, coming to, to my friend from, from Nigeria, uh, absolutely the role of policymakers is key. Uh, and what I see in the ITU and often in the context of, of UN discussions is that there's still an absence of understanding of the power and potential of connectivity in terms of the whole UN agenda and program, and I would say in terms of global development. We often see uh, around the margins of the General Assembly, there's lots of, I would say, scattered things happening in the space of connectivity, lots of silos, but we need to bring it all together because um, it is digital that will help us, as I said before, address some of our greatest developmental challenges. And unless we get world leaders to, to put this at the top of their agenda, it's not going to happen. So we need to have that political will there to make it happen. And so policymakers are absolutely fundamental in, in, in this space, uh, as are ICT regulators, because they can help set the enabling framework as well. Um, certainly your point about communities, I absolutely agree. Uh, we really need to be empowering and enabling communities. In one of the discussions I was in this morning, uh, we, we talked about the urban-rural divide, and, and if we can figure out ways to connect communities better, then you don't have everybody moving into your cities. And so really that community focus, I think, is, is key uh, to sustainability and to, 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 to growth. Yeah. Any other questions? Mike, can I put you on the spot? Uh, th thanks, Doreen. Actually, I was, uh, I was hoping you might uh, come back for a few questions because one of the areas that uh, I thought was particularly worth focusing on is access to spectrum. I was fortunate enough to uh, do a 15-country study last year looking specifically at connectivity issues in remote rural communities in the developing countries. And one of our conclusions was that uh, the biggest barrier was access to spectrum um, for small-scale areas where, although there have been national allocations, those frequencies were not in use in these remote areas. And that, that was really the only barrier to actually establishing a local mobile network, for example. Yeah, th thank you for, for raising that. And of course, as, as many of you may know, ITU just concluded its World Radio Communications Conference uh, last Friday, a four-week conference. 
uh, in Sharm El Sheikh, and of course it was all about all about spectrum. Uh, and, and spectrum, as you may know, it's a, it's a finite resource. Uh, spectrum is, is limited, but Mike, as you, you rightly said, uh, in many cases, there's lots of unused spectrum. Um, and so, you know, we do need to, to look at working with governments uh, and working with other stakeholders to figure out ways to make sure that spectrum is used in the most efficient way. Um, we have had uh, lots of discussions on community networks. Uh, we are working with ISOC and others uh, to do some specific country case studies, uh, community studies, I should say, uh, in Latin America. And I hope that we can figure out ways to further uh, share that in the context of the African region and, and elsewhere. I think there was a question just back here, please, if you can introduce yourself. Hello, thank you for giving me this chance. My name is Peace and I work for Women of Uganda Network and um, talking about access, I think we all know that women are so very much left behind. Uh, but I'll, what I think uh, we should also be looking at as we speak about uh, access and closing the digital divide, uh, the gap that we have or the digital gender divide, as I might, as I may put it. I think we should also look at things like community networks. Because even if we have, let's say, the, the, the policies, we have the issues of affordability, uh, we have issues of literacy at play, I think, I think uh, the issue of digital, uh, uh, the issue of community networks could really help a lot because this is something that the communities feel that they own. Uh, because we see a lot of telecoms not going to some rural areas because, of course, it will not make a lot of economic sense to them. But I think if we put uh, community networks in these very rural areas, then it could give them a chance to be connected. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and as I was mentioning, we are uh, starting to do some work on, on community networks in, in Latin America and also looking elsewhere. Um, in the ITU context, for those of you that are not familiar with the ITU, one of the things I think in the Development Bureau that we do well uh, is provide a forum to share best practices, uh, to share experiences. And so when it comes to uh, connecting communities, this is something that, that we look to uh, our member governments and also the private sector and our other members to share what they're doing. Uh, so I would invite those of you that have an interest, you know, share what you're doing. Uh, you can share it in the context of the Development Bureau. You can also share it in the context of the World Summit on the Information Society Forum uh, that meets annually in, in Geneva. Uh, the IGF was an outcome of, of, of the WISIS, as was the WISIS Forum. Uh, and so those are good opportunities to share uh, what you're doing, share local solutions, and hopefully we can see how to uh, replicate them and to scale. Of course, you're, you also mentioned uh, the importance of, of, of women and, and girls, um, and we're doing a lot of work in that space, and our breakfast this morning was on the uh, Equals Global Partnership, where we're very excited to have over 100 members, uh, and it's very much focused on closing the uh, access divide closing the skills divide, and then closing the leadership divide, meaning bringing more women uh, into the technology sector uh, and trying to uh, facilitate the pipeline for future women leaders, in particular of, of SMEs. One more question, and then I'll turn back to Susan. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, Valencia Drisvianikov from the International Federation of Library Associations. And uh, while we are on the subject of uh, good practices and other connectivity solutions and uh, models, um, you have mentioned this year's Broadband uh, Commission State of Broadband Report. And actually, one of the recommendations that we have seen the report make this year is uh, public access uh, facilities. Uh, so I was just wondering if you could perhaps share a bit what has been the thought process behind this recommendation, what role you're hoping public access facilities would play. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And I'm pleased that you've 
paid attention to the state of broadband report, that's great. Uh, and indeed, um, public access uh, is something that, that the report promotes. And I would say in the context of, of, of libraries, that's also something that was one of the um, intended outcomes in the actions decided by the World Summit on the Information Society. It was about connecting schools, connecting libraries, uh, connecting hospitals, and you know, libraries, of course, are, are a great place to, to bring uh, communities in, and we've seen some interesting examples of um, community, uh, well, connected libraries, then bringing in communities and being able to uh, roll out other sort of e-government services in the context of, of those libraries. Um, so in the Broadband Commission, we have been, uh, I would say, gathering uh, experiences and, and stories from our commissioners uh, and trying to share them in the context of our annual report. Uh, and we also have a number of specific um, working groups uh, that are in progress that will come up with specific recommendations as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I'll stop there. There's one question in the back. Do we have time? Okay, one last question and then I hand back to, to Susan. Do you want to come forward to the microphone, please? Thank you. Uh, my name is Judy Okite from uh, Nairobi, Kenya, Association for Accessibility and Equality. Um, I would like to hear about what you're doing with, uh, regarding persons with disability. Over time, when we talk about accessibility, we talk about infrastructure. But how about a situation whereby um, a person is not able to access the information, to access content? Is there anything that is going on? Thank you. Uh, absolutely. There's a lot going on within the context of the ITU and the Development Bureau and also linked to uh, the WISIS Forum, as I mentioned before. Uh, we believe that when uh, technology is actually created, we should be thinking accessible by design. Um, of course, it's next week that we will have the UN Day on Persons with, uh, with Disabilities. Uh, we have a big event in Europe, Accessible Europe. We just concluded our Accessible Americas event, uh, and we take uh, those issues very seriously. And I would invite you uh, afterwards, if you're interested, I'm happy to give you more specifics, as I've been told. I have to have to stop so we take some time for the breakouts. So thank you, thank you very much for that and uh, look forward to uh, further discussions, thank you. Thank you, Doreen, very compelling remarks and perfect to send us into discussions that will break new ground in the digital inclusion area. Um, so what we're going to do now is to move into different uh, corners of the room, not all corners because this room only has four and we have five discussion groups. So, um, All right, so let's start with access, affordability, and infrastructure. Um, your leader will be Delcy, and so please, if you are interested, join this corner, and um, you can move the chairs. We'll have to move them back, of course, uh, but circles work best for a discussion. Next, we have local content and multilingualism, Liana. Uh, we'll go over here in this corner for this discussion, those who are interested in local content and multilingualism. Skills, education, and jobs. Rose will be leading. Um, so shall we go over in that corner, you reckon? Yep, so skills, education, and jobs will be over here. Social inclusion. Juliana will be your group leader. Um, Juliana, do you want to go over there? Yeah. And then last, but certainly not least, we'll do uh, governance discussions with June. Um, so governance is over here, and I, I noticed that um, gender and, and youth are <laughs> not part of these sub-themes per se, but please feel free to weave in these questions. Um, so we'll take about uh, 30 minutes, and I'll give you a 10-minute 10 uh, 10 minute, uh, heads up. Okay, thanks. Can the group moderators make themselves visible? 
And then those, those that are undecided, uh, try, try and select one of the groups that's less represented. Also, for those who are participating remotely, um, we will check in with you uh, after the breakout group discussions. Thank you for your patience. Do we have any more volunteers for governance? We're, we're a little low on numbers on governance. Governance is over on the right. 